probably roll into episodes like this part will probably be in the podcast we just roll right into it so um yeah just kind of how we do it um welcome back everybody to eric the painter hosted by eric um who's not really a painter uh we're doing an interesting episode here today it's currently 9 p.m on a tuesday i i agreed to this podcast with mr mike gore hickman and about 30 minutes before i was like what am i doing man this is my bedtime like what are we doing here man i mean (laughs) it's i mean we're weak we're weekly enough to expo things are just kind of crazy and we want to just kind of have fun with this so we're like hey let's just if we do it if we do it after hours um it kind of takes takes the pressure off of having to i don't know take an hour during the day and then you got that's what we'll tell ourselves yeah that's what we'll tell ourselves um but it is the week leading up to expo it's certainly a crazy week at least at least on our end for all sorts of things, not necessarily expo related things, at least on, on our side. I don't know about you, but, um, but yeah, Mike, welcome to the podcast. It's a fun time. This is what we do. Um, dude, I, um, I don't know. I was kind of thinking about like, I don't know, what, what do we want to talk about this podcast? And, uh, I, I kind of wanted to start here, man. Like I, I've heard, I, I don't want to go through like your whole story and journey. People can go listen to all the other podcasts you've been on and all that sort of stuff. But like, Dude, you were a painter at some point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you're and now I'm a now. painter. <laughs> yeah. and now I'm a painter, and I know you've kind of talked about this before, but like, I'd I'd love to like actually go back because like even just for myself, I'm curious. Like, actually go back. You running a painting business, like, what was it like? Like, what did you hate? What did you love? Because like now I'm doing that thing. Yeah, you know? you know, you know, you're in the fire now. It's funny. In the last two days, uh, maybe three days, I've gotten into two like pretty heated comment sections on facebook <laughs> oh gotta um, love them right yeah on my ads actually and one of them <laughs> one of the and i i'm like if someone can like prove me like not prove me wrong but like like open my eyes and and educate me on on these two topics and i'm i'm more like i'm open to it the first one was with a union painter mm. who those are always fun feels that the union is the only way to operate a painting business. And if you want to make money, you got to work for the union. And if you want to run a good ethical business that treats its painters, right, you have to have union painters. Union. And I was kind of like pushing back on that. Like, I don't think that that's at all true, but um, so that was like, I have a room for ed- I'm open to being educated there. And the other one was um, someone who was very adamant that, I know nothing about painting and I'm not a painter because I'm not a master of architectural science and I don't like study (laughs) like flow dynamics and materials and, and all this stuff. Like I just, I know how to paint walls and trim and doors, but that doesn't make me a painter because I don't dedicate to the craft. Just today I, I deleted somebody from, from my Facebook uh, and I, I normally don't do that. Normally I, I let the haters hate a little bit. I respond to them, but this, this one, he started just getting personal on stuff. But yeah, I started saying that I'm a, I'm a bad person that doesn't care about his team and I'm a jerk and I'm a this and a that because I want to operate a business and travel and see places of the world and the rest of the country and not just paint with his guys every single day. How dare you? I was like, that's an intense statement. Or the you people know? It's like, if you're not person. on the tools with your guys, you're a bad leader. Yeah, I was like, I could make a lot of arguments that's the other way. But yeah, when like half that paragraph was like about my character as a person, I'm like, I don't even know who this guy is. Like, we'll just. Mm-hmm. just, just I mean, to go back one. to me be, starting my painting business. Um, so I did it with a student painting organization back in 2011, I think 2010 or 2011 started my company. And um, I got recruited in thought it was you know i was sold a dream of you can make money and and the way that these student painting businesses work and they get a bad rap but they're honestly they're they're pretty dude so hot take i've recently had because i've met more and more people that started in student painting business franchises and now they are in their own painting businesses or they run a coaching program or they run this dude i actually think that the student like the college pros the whatever in terms of uh, how to go create a business course it might be in, in especially a painting business, like going in, that might be one of the best ones out there. The college franchises are the ones I see teaching how to recruit W2 painters. So you're learning leadership. Like they, those franchises have created some champions mm-hmm. after, in the aftermath. I mean, it's in the market, just Jason Paris comes to mind. 
He's doing yeah. 10 million a year, you know, eight figures in residential repaints. I think Barstow from... started out uh, yeah. student, some sort yeah, of student Barstow painter, did. right? Yeah. yeah, a ton of them. So I learned it as a business student and I learned the, the trade of painting during my second year university or third year or something like that. And it was, it was like going through the fire. I mean, there was, there was parts of it that I was really good at. Like I was good at the finance. I was good at the marketing. Like I could door to door your lights out, you know, like <laughs> I could, I could do all that. I could get jobs. I could book them. It actually took me a long time to book my first job. My first job was disastrous, like a $500 fence. And I was so pumped to get it. Just about lost my shirt on that. Um, <laughs> but the, the part that was probably the most challenging to learn was uh, just training painters. And, and yeah. their, their model was to train students. So you're taking right. other like 19 and 20 years old kids and you're trying to teach them how to paint on someone else's house that you've sold. Like they're not doing training pro pro projects. These are projects that the customers are paying for. <laughs> so that's probably the, the sliver where student painting gets a bad rap because there will be some projects that turn out bad. But there's some projects that turn out bad on you professional freaking painters, right? Like Also true. Yeah. Yeah. So that was that was fun um, learning that skill. But I do think that that taught me a lot about humans and about personal development and teaching people and transferring skills. Like if you can teach a, a student how to be a painter in seven days, you can pretty <laughs> much teach anyone anything. <laughs> and you learn yeah. like systems, you learn about systems and processes and formulas and frameworks. And, and once you start transferring knowledge and you learn how knowledge can be transferred and what percentage people intake the first time versus the second time, like it's just everyone should go through some sort of experience like that. Very yeah. valuable. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely makes sense. And, and like I said, it matches what I've seen. You know, another guy comes to mind that, you know, we were talking to potentially onboarding as a client and he was student painting franchise, whatever first and now started his own thing. He knows all his numbers, has his projections, his goal setting, all that sort of stuff and has been through some of those same experiences, trained painters, et cetera. Um, so it all, it all, it all makes sense. And I see how it's, it's such good training. Um, that business did well for you, right? It grew and you've had some, yep. you had some impressive numbers in it. Yeah. By my third year, um, we were doing just shy of about 200,000 a month. So I think I had five crews, um, all W2s, except on one project I hired like a crew of subs, but pretty much all in-house employees and, um, inflation adjusted. Actually, I just ran the numbers the other day. He's like an inflation calculator. It would be like yeah. 340 a month. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot of production hours. I think it was like 4,000 production hours a month or something. Jeez. Yeah. Um, but it was a good uh, operation. I mean, I took all the systems that they taught me, but, and then I had to like rebuild them for like that size of business. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I can imagine your average student painter franchise probably wasn't quite, you, you were probably pushing the, do, did they have like a rankings? Like, do you know like where you were in the whole country with the franchise? <laughs> yeah. Um, and of this, yeah, I, I do. Um, so I was, I ended up getting, second ah but the person who got first was kind of like uh i would say he got first through unethical means like he was like second on the leaderboard all year and then like the day that it was closed down or whatever it was he found 60k oh. <laughs> like wow you're really close with your bot with your gm mm -hmm. so um so i got yeah but anyway i i i have come to terms with that over the last <laughs> 13 years or 10 years or whatever it's been like, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that now Good. because uh, I'm glad you're not still holding that grudge. <laughs> no, it's all about like, uh, what do they say? Like, um, you need to like not prove your haters wrong with your words, but like be more successful than them or something like that. There's some sort of, I, yeah, I don't know what term or like that. phrase where it's like, prove, like, yeah. Anyway. In, yeah, we'll just we'll just sign right. that one for now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, like the the very obvious question, and I I know you talked about this a little bit before, but I wanna I wanna go a little deeper here, just like selfishly, I'm I'm really curious, right? Obviously, I know you moved, and painting businesses are local, and you had more of a more of an opportunity and more of a interest and a passion for coaching other painters and and helping them and everything. And I know you you were in the marketing agency spot for a while and then kind of transitioned to coaching more more just coaching. Like, why not reopen the paint business? Like, was like, did you not enjoy it? Like, like the real talk. Did you because yeah. I'm in it now? There's parts that suck. There's some amazing parts that I love, but yeah. there's parts that suck where you just like, I don't like it. This doesn't fit my lifestyle. Like, what made you not want to 
do it again. So how, what happened is, um, for people who know Canadian geography, I, I, uh, ran my painting business in Saskatoon, which is in Saskatchewan, which is like kind of north of Denver ish yeah. in the prairies. And then my girlfriend at the time, we've been dating for like six months. Uh, she got a transition through her job to Edmonton, which is like a five hour drive away. And this was in like May of my, um, third year of painting. And so I basically painted all that summer and like ran that my big business and she was living in Edmonton. We're doing the long distance thing. And then in September, I was just like finishing up all my exterior work, like making the decision, do I keep going or do I move to Edmonton? And I'm just like, I got to follow the girl. Hmm. So I'm, we're married now and we have two kids. So it wasn't hey, it was a good decision. Yeah. Well, that was a good decision, nice. but I uh, got to Edmonton with all intentions to start up my painting business again. Um, went more like we, I started up with a friend of mine and we started doing some commercial projects. We were doing some apartments, doing a lot of boom lift stuff, got a few like, uh, department stores like bye bye baby and a couple of those and things were going well to start. Um, but then I got an opportunity to work for this online startup. So a friend of mine from the, um, college pro painting days, actually, he was another like, like big dog. He did, uh, he called me, he's like, Hey, we've started this like online um, software company, software slash marketing company, and we need some people on the ground floor. And I was like, this is a really cool opportunity. How often do you get something like this? So I hung up the brush, went all in on this. And um, I mean, within three years, we helped them scale to like 10 million a year. So it was a cool opportunity to kind of get in on the ground floor of a software company that was growing really quickly and got to be with them and help them grow really quickly. And I found like, it was an opportunity to learn a completely new set of skills instead of continuing to hone the set of skills that I already had. What, what was it like leaving the business in Saskatoon painters? You probably made relationships with over years. Oh yeah. Right? People you provided jobs for did it, did you pass the business off to somebody else and say, Hey, here, now you run this was it just like, sorry guys, I'm not doing this anymore. What I mean, that? most of my, uh, most of my painters were, uh, like seasonal. Like I had some painters ready to go into the fall, but most of them were summer, like, like students. heavy exterior. Yeah. Heavy exterior. Well, yeah. Season. Part time in school, I guess. Yeah, so yeah. that wasn't a huge, it wasn't a career huge. for them. No, no, not really. But I, I had some painters that were like, all right, let's go. Like, what are you doing this winter? Like, let's roll. So there was like <laughs> a little bit of that. But, um, I mean, when it's like a big personal move like that, like where I was pretty close to my guys, like they understood. Yeah. 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 So that wasn't a huge, huge moment or anything, but yeah, I was stoked. I was stoked to go try out a new city. And for anyone who's like moved from, to a new city from their hometown, like it's, it's awesome going to a different city for a little while. I've just, I've seen not, not often, but I've seen a couple people in the paint space have a big opportunity like that to do something, whatever. And it's naturally very scary, right. To leave this business and you feel like you owe it to all these people, to the clients you have deposits for, to all these, what, all these people you've built relationships with for years. And I think sometimes people kind of feel trapped in that. Or right? I mean, I, I probably would. I mean, I had, I was in a fortunate position where I had an opportunity come to my lap. And at the same time, I was, I was, I wasn't like full two feet into painting at the time. Like we, we had a dozen projects or something booked and we were working, we had some contractors, but I was actually, um, I was actually painting a lot at that time too. Like I just hadn't really like made the network. I don't in know Alberta? what it was. Yeah. Like, but I was talking back in Saskatoon before you moved. Mm. What was like you weren't painting then you were, doing no, no, I wasn't painting all then, but when adjusted I, for inflation 340. Yeah. When I moved to Edmonton, I was painting on some of these big commercial sites. I mean, thinking back, I think I was just probably pretty immature. Like I was still 23. <laughs> yeah. I ran a good business, but you know, you're still developing when you're in your early 20s. How old do you know? You're like, shh. Definitely, definitely <laughs> past development. Okay. All right. So I think <laughs> no, I was 25, 25. I think I was still, like uh, still like developing, still a little immature, but got a new opportunity and shifted. And um, I mean, without that shift, I wouldn't be able to have the skill set that I have right now to be able to mm. lead a, a remote team of 20 people and learn like how to manage projects online, how to be effective and how to communicate, you know, across departments and get things done. Like it was really vital to be for like the development of painter growth. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe that does part of you wish you still had a painting business in some capacity just to like have a finger on the pulse of like the current market, what sales frameworks, you know, whatever. 
I don't think that's necessary. So do I sometimes miss painting? Sometimes, <laughs> but I get, a, I'm really, I feel like I'm really close with the, to the fire with how close I am to many of my clients Yeah, and our coaches. Like our one uh, top coach, Jesse, um, he runs a, you know, one and a half million dollar painting business in, he has a GM now. So he, he works about an hour a week, but anything that we have going on, he tests in his business. So that's kind of like my painting arm, yeah, or my painting vehicle. vision. Yeah. So we get, we get the testing. He's you know really communicative, really good at implementing things. And um, so that keeps me close to the fire. And then I'm, like I said, I'm really close with my, with my clients. We, I feel like I'm like, I'm on the job site a lot of the time. <laughs> yep. Been there a hundred percent. I, I totally feel that too. What do you think you miss the most when you're like, sometimes, yeah, I do. I miss painting. What, what aspects? The biggest of thing it? is for sure the connection with the community. Hmm. Really? Yeah. Like there's I just would not have expected you to say so that. So much less of that when you're like working online. I have a great team, you know, great, you know, like partners like you guys and like you and Tanner and Austin and like a lot of good like industry friends, right? And we can have good relationships like this. We're going to go hang out at the expo. We'll probably hang out another time this year. Um, and that's cool. And then I meet with my team, touch out with my team every single day, talk with the clients every day, but like none of this is in my city, mm. <laughs> right? I can go, I can't go to the grocery store and like see homeowners that I know and like strike up conversations. So there is like a level of disconnect from the community that I do community. miss. Yeah. So now that we've just moved to a new city, just like a couple weeks ago, I'm actually back home in, in Saskatoon after being gone for 10 years. Um, I'm going to make like we just moved like two weeks ago. So I'm making a, like a really diligent effort to get like connected with like the business owner, the entrepreneurship community in the city, just so I can get that community connection a little bit. Cause it's yeah. important. It is. I totally get that. I mean, Cor Corinne already knows, right. It's, it's ironically um, been something I've struggled a lot with in, in Cleveland and, and it's most have been probably my own self doing, Right, I haven't made much of an effort to create a community here because I already have my community spread out throughout the rest of the world. I have tons mm -hmm. of friends in like most of my communities in Medellin. I have a portion of that in Miami and Atlanta and Austin and Denver. Um, just through the online community I've built over the last four years, right? Those are the hubs where everybody is. And I think because of that, I've also and, and there's not much about the city of Cleveland that excites me. So I haven't. I've I've been resistant. I think yeah. to to start some of that here and, and it certainly made it more lonely. Um, but it's interesting hearing you say like, that's the part you miss most about it. Cause to me, I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm just thinking like scalable business, right. In my painting business. So I'm not, I'm not trying if I'm like, ah, oh, like something like real local and in the community. I'm like, I don't know. I want to do that. Cause uh, it's not as going to be as scalable. Right. It's, it's, so it's really interesting hearing you say that's the part you missed the most. Yeah, I might be past that that thought around like scalable business because I mean the vehicle that I'm in right now is a very scalable business and we've been able to see some pretty good scale over the last two years since starting Painter Growth, two and a half years. So I feel like that having to scratch that scalable business business itch is kind of out of my system. Yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not even that it's scalable as well, but like yeah, scalable and without me and I'm like, man, like if I start getting real involved in the community, parts of that might get harder, you Dude, know, ask Jason um, Paris how that went for him. Yeah, no, there's, there's a thousand percent people that have, that have done that. Um, I don't know. I've just been, I've been more resistant to it. I mean, everything is a, is a system can be broken down to a system and a process. And as long as you have the right people in place, I mean, an online, any online business is just as scalable as an offline business, except for like software. Any service based right. business is, is pretty is pretty similar that requires like people to implement. Just the cool thing about an online business is that like your recruiting arm can be anywhere. anywhere. Like our head coach Zach, um, he actually operated a twenty million dollar um paying division for a franchise company and he lives in freaking uh Portugal. That's sick. Yeah, it's awesome. He's got his kid there. His sister lives there. His wife's there. Like he just lives in Portugal and he just works for us and for some other stuff. Like he, it's awesome. <laughs> but yeah. I can't. I couldn't work for him if I was just running a painting business here. Like he would never come here to like be exactly. my GM or like be a whatever. So exactly. there's definitely some limitations for local. Yeah. No. Most definitely. Definitely. Um. 
Coaching painters. I do some of that here and there. It's got some ups mm-hmm. and some downs. Um, what What are your favorite parts about it? And what are the parts, man, that, that suck? So actually, I've, a couple of days ago, my wife said something to me, Amanda. She's awesome. Um, Shout out, Amanda. She'll never listen to this, but... <laughs> <laughs> Um, but she's great. She's good. She's my biggest cheerleader. And she said something really cool the other day. And it was, um, I love what you're doing. I love what you built because you're not helping the rich get richer, but you're helping like people who need it the most and like everyday people change their lives. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's, it's like, like the way she phrased it was really cool because it's like the people that get the big, I'm going to talk about my boy, Elijah. Elijah came in, he had a lawn, a lawn company. He was, he wanted to get into painting. He knew how to paint, didn't know how to start a painting company. He joined in like June of last year, I think had done $10,000 of like lawn repair. He's in West Virginia, poorest state in the nation, right? He'll tell you that. Yep. He did about $10,000 of lawn care between January and June last year. He joined up and then between, between June and December, he produced $200,000 of painting contracts. He bought a brand new car. First time anyone in his family has ever owned a brand new car. Um, and he's like, hey, guess what, Mike? I just bought a brand new iPad. I didn't even, I didn't even have to check my bank account before I bought it. <laughs> right? That's and so cool. like literally life-changing. Yeah. And that's yeah. just like one of like dozens and dozens of stories like that. And it's it's cool to be able to have that impact. And so when people ask me, it's like, hey, why don't you, why don't you get back in painting? Like that would add so much credibility to you. This, I would never have the same impact. I can't change someone's life like that with painting. And that's no, no, like nothing negative about painting. There's no disrespect there. It's just the impact that I can have with coaching and this unique skill set that I have that not everybody has. I can have a huge impact and I've been having a huge impact. And I can say that humbly and with so much gratitude for my clients who've trusted me, especially the early ones before I had like logos or fancy sites or fancy marketing or a team. It's like, hey, you give me some money and I'm going to teach you how to get jobs. And they're like, okay, right. don't screw me over. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and they did. And, um, and that allowed us to keep growing. And um, it's just been <clears throat> a really fulfilling um, business. And I hope I can keep doing it for years and years. Well, it's interesting. I, one of the things I've actually found a lot of fulfillment on that same level from the painting business specifically, um, because it's almost like, you come more down to the basic level and it's like, man, this person who like, like with your actual painters, right? This person who, and I'm not necessarily on the the college uh, hiring model, but it's like you hire this person that they've been screwed over by boss after boss after boss. They have an incredible skill set. They're very talented and they've never really been able to make more than 20 an hour consistently or whatever. And you can pull them in, they have an organized business. They know the address they're going to every day. They get paid on time on Friday. No questions asked W2. They can go get a loan and they have a bonus structure and they're averaging 23 an hour in their first month. And they're like, they're just like, like that is such an impact for them. And then they get promoted to job site manager and have a van. And, and it's like, dude, like, like you're making a huge, it's a different impact. It, uh, cause I've seen, I felt both, right. It's very different. Um, but to your point, like not to knock the painters and for anybody listening, like you can, there's certainly a lot of very valuable impact to be had on the other side. It's just much different. That's true. Then, you know what? I, I never thought of that because I had never experienced that, you know, changing a painter's life from that. But, but being that, you know, responsible leader who's organized and like you said, pays on time, the amount that they, they paid and there's always work on Monday. Um, you know, that's like my, a lot of my team now, um, like we have some team members down in South America and they're like, we've never had a boss that like, can, I can take time off and like give bonuses. Yeah. And like, I bought mm-hmm. some of my team computers and power sources and all this stuff. And they're like, yeah. what is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think especially with painters, Corinne, maybe you're about to say it, right. They've so many of them have just been screwed over so many times before. So many times, like, one of our job site managers now came to us and like hadn't been paid for like two months from a previous employer. It's like, that's crazy. So yeah. It wouldn't happen in the union. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
No, what I was going to say is when you're like, oh, I have a boss that allows me to take time off, um, something that happened this week um, that was kind of cool to... Because Eric asked you to work at nine o'clock at night. (laughs) Yeah. For the podcast. No, I told him it was optional. When when you postponed it a little bit, when you're like, hey, can we push it back a few? I was like, Corinne, if you don't want to come, like, you don't have to. (laughs) He was like, no, it's fine. I was like, grab a glass of wine if you want, you know, do your thing, whatever. Yeah, I used to have those bosses that allowed time off. Now I don't. No, I'm just kidding. Um, But there was, um, we have a a request off channel in our Slack and one of the painters put off or put in that they wanted off for the eclipse that's coming off or that's coming up in um, April. And our um, project manager was like, is that an allowable like excuse like to miss work? And um, Eric's response was, you know, absolutely. One of the things that I value here is whatever jazzes people up or whatever fulfills people, whether it's like a concert or festival that you want to go to and you asked off for, or or whether it's somebody's, you know, they want to see the solar eclipse. Um, You know, they're both valid and we want to give room for that here. So absolutely, you know, they put in enough notice and yeah, they're going to be off to see that. So I don't know. I thought it was cool. So it is, you know, to your point, oh, I've never had a boss that lets me have time off, you know, kind of had one of those moments this week nice where they're not used yeah. to that so that is on my bucket list actually i'm a big space nerd believe it or not <laughs> i would love to see dude an eclipse in person so actually dude look this up I, I don't know what type of eclipse it is but there's an eclipse like one of the weekends in april here yeah, april 8th up. i see it it's like all the way across the states that's pretty cool yeah like, yeah like Texas parts like cleveland is one of the best cities to view it in my brother's airbnbs have been booked up for like five times the rate like four months ago <laughs> like people wow. are coming to cleveland for this and i feel i probably actually won't even be in cleveland for it ironically but it's like a once in a 150 year thing like crazy so wicked you're a space nerd you should see it i should see that i think oh, i don't know just I'm don't look directly in at april. the sun <laughs> yeah you gotta get the special glasses i'm not doing anything in april maybe I the cardboard gotta, box thing or something you got a coach for me yeah, my brother's got a couple Airbnb. I mean, I can be here. You can just have my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the record. <laughs> it, it is. It you is. know what? I, I've been meaning to actually go visit Cleveland. My Sherwin rep has been bugging me. So come on down, man. There's an opportunity. Come on down. You can see the paint business. You can give me go you share some, a really some special growth moment. tips. Yeah. See if I can get in with the uh, like the the president of Resri at Sherwin, watch an eclipse with them. Dude, that would be pretty cool. Invite me to that party. Dude, I yeah. called um <clears throat> we we did a we did a walkthrough the other day and I'm still doing a couple walkthroughs with my project manager just as we're training on him a little bit. And the lady whose job we sold, her nephew owns or not owns, but is a store manager for a Sherwin. And I knew that going in and it was in our notes and whatever. And we're talking with her, she's like, Yeah, he runs a commercial store. And our store manager just got promoted and moved to a commercial store. I was like, oh, it's not the one in Avon, is it? Whatever. And she's like, yeah. I was like, no way. It's same. It happened to be the same person. Anyways, long story short, I call him on the way back. I was like, yo, guess who we just did a walkthrough with? And his first guess, he's like, the CEO of Sherwin. I was like, this guy, that guy lives in Cleveland. Like what? Apparently, apparently he actually does. And he knows where he lives. So I mean, I may have insider information. We may be able to go door knock him a little bit, you know, give him, give him our pitch. Come watch the uh, eclipse with us. That was very <laughs> presumptive of you. It's a she. Her name's Heidi. Yes. Okay. Actually, I did know that. I did know that. That yeah. that, that was my my fault. Brand new January first, twenty twenty four. Yes. So she's less she's than two months in. Yeah. She was. I forget. She was high up before and got promoted. She was. I forget her exact title and stuff before, yeah. but yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So, dude, what's the what's the hardest part? of coaching painting contractors. Like if I was a painting contractor joining a coaching program right now, like what would, what would your tips be to see the most out of that program? And I, I don't totally love that question, but like you, I think you get what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. Like what's, what's the hardest part for you coaching painters. And if you could just like instill this one thing in them to help them be more successful with coaching programs and masterminds and courses and stuff, like what would it, I yeah. mean, I think you probably base the like the the spirit of this question off of your video the other week about like how to work with marketing agencies, right? Like look like look at a marketing agency as you're like a partner in marketing, not like yeah. someone who works for you, but someone who you work with, right? Mm-hmm. Kind yeah. of like that spirit. 
I guess so, so. Yeah, I don't really, I don't even totally know what I'm trying to ask. I mean, <laughs> when I first started um, Painter Growth, which it was not Painter Growth at the time, um, but anyway, when I first started this coaching program, when I I thought that if I told painters what to do, they would just go do it because they paid me to, to learn. Yeah. And I found that that was not the case. <laughs> it's yeah. like, okay, here's a bunch of money. Tell me what to do. And then I tell them what to do and they proceed to not do it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this was probably my, like, uh, my learning curve with how to be, I, I've never taken education. I'm not a teacher. Right. So there's like a lot of education theory that I don't know. And I, I mean, I know how to transfer skills in person to a painter and like teach someone to paint who doesn't know how to paint, but to teach someone and to motivate someone, even if they are self-proclaimed self-motivated, it's, it's actually not as easy as it sounds. So I had to learn, um, like what, how much I can teach someone at one time and while I'm teaching them how to continually remind them of their whys so that they do the hard thing. Mm. So for example, one of our many things that we teach, one of the, one of the tactics is, you know, surprise, surprise, we do teach door to door marketing, but we teach it in a way where we want to help get the owner off of that task as quickly as possible. So they can hire, um, actually you don't even have to hire students. You can hire full grown men and women to do it because you can actually pay them a lot of money. Um, cause it very, can be very lucrative, but anyway, um, we want to teach them how to set up those teams and how to train people and how to transfer that right. skill. But to transfer the skill of transferring skills is like hard. They need to learn the thing first. So yeah. it's just about like, I had to figure out the, the, the little tiny bits that I could teach someone at a time and get them to go do, get them a little win, come back, learn another thing, get them a bigger win, come back, learn another thing, get them a bigger win. And so as we've done that with now over 400 painting contractors, I think we've got a pretty good system on like how to actually get people to take, take, uh, take action. The hardest thing though, is figuring out when someone is like doing really well or on the brink of over overwhelm, especially and painting contractors are not big sharers, right? Not big emotional, like, Hey, here's hard on, it's hard on my sleeve. Yep. So understanding when they're at the brink of over overwhelm and almost like calling that out before they even tell us. Mm -hmm. so that we can help them proactively. So that's been pretty cool to, to kind of learn how to do that. And there's some, there's some indicators um, that we've kind of identified to help us figure that out. We're not, not perfect yet, but, um, and then, and then having the system. So break, break it down for them. I'm like, okay, here's how, here's how to get a control of your time. You're too overwhelmed. Here's how to like mm -hmm. get everything out of your brain and prioritize and like still get production done and, and all this stuff. I don't know if I answered your, your, your vague question, but I went for it. <laughs> no, I mean, as, as somebody that is often having very similar conversations with painters, um, you know, for maybe others listening going, that doesn't seem like that tricky, whatever it, it is like, that's, it's very difficult. And you articulated it extremely, extremely well, um, in much, in, in even then easier said than done. Right. So I, I totally, totally resonate. It makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Are there common themes that you get from, um, you know, your painters that you're working with as to why they're not implementing what you're instructing them to do, like yeah. resistance to change or just logistical reasons. Because I do think that's a reality, right? If you look at the online education space, and it's less with like a coaching program, especially a good coaching program, because there's a lot of accountability measures and stuff in place. But if you look at like, like there, and there's been stats polled of like courses and course sales, like 80% of people that purchase a course don't even like finish the whole thing or whatever, yeah. let alone like 1% is actually going to implement some of the teachings and stuff. Again, that'll happen less with a coaching program where you have accountability and all that. But yeah, like, especially in an industry that's so rampant with that, like what are the commonalities and the people that don't take the action that don't do some of that stuff? So one thing that I, so we actually just did a, um, training to a live training today on, um, procrastination. So procrastination is probably one of the biggest reasons. Well, I mean, yeah, the, I guess by definition, right? The reason why people don't take action as well as at, on the things that they know that they should. And so we talked like we had 60, 65 painters on our coaching call today. And we talked about procrastination for an hour and I had a little poll and I asked like, like, why are you procrastinating? And, you know, is it, um, I'm just looking at the results here uh, on the poll. We didn't do a very good poll, but um, sorry, why are you doing this? Is it for 
finding material wealth, providing for your family or eventual time freedom or securing your future. And so we had people vote on that. And then it was, oh, there it is, overwhelm. So why do you think you procrastinate? Is it fear, overwhelm, environment, unclear or uncertain what to do? And overwhelm was by far the biggest yeah. the biggest reason why people didn't weren't taking action or were procrastinating, right? Like how many times have you looked at your to-do list? It is well, a isn't mile that kind long. of ironic. It's totally like you ironic. Have, you have too much to do. So then you end up not doing it. Yeah. Dude. One of my favorite quotes, um, from one of my not so favorite coaches was, <laughs> uh, action cures anxiety. Yeah. And it, it has a time in its place. It can be a dangerous one to lean on too much, but, there's been times or two, like a, a time or two where I've been super anxious. I've had so much on my list where I'm just like, F this. Let me just stay up till 3 a.m. and get it all done. And then I would just be like, oh, and then I'd finally like sleep. And like it was like there's a time and a place for it, I, I, ironically. And I don't know if you've experienced those, but I have. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to like when you look at the to do list, you're just so overwhelmed. So you just like open up YouTube or open up Reddit and just like <laughs> doom scroll and just have this like pit in your stomach. You're like, why aren't I doing any work? And then you go to bed and you just feel even worse. So action definitely cures it, but it does have to be like curated action. And that's why, you know, not to self late, but like having a coach is so valuable to like just point you in the right direction. It's like, yes. hey, don't do this, do this. Like, I have a coach. I meet with my coach every week and I'm like, he's like, I'm like, Tom, I don't know what to do. I have too many things to do. Or like, I don't know what I should be doing today. He's like, Mike, how did this go? How did that go? How are you doing this? How are you doing here? Okay, you should do this and you should do that. Okay, so then I write those two things down. And then I know whenever I like, you have time to work on my business, I look at my two priorities and I'm like, is what I'm doing furthering these two things? Yep. If it is, continue. If it's not, change what I'm doing to do something else to further these two things. So we're working on project like right now, um, like we're working on Ascension and we're like working on, uh, new, uh, new enrollments. So those are kind of my two projects for this month is like, we have a few systems to build. So like, are the systems that I'm currently working on, is it furthering Ascension or new enrollments? <laughs> if right. it's not doing either of those things, I'm just like screwing around, like creating a SOP for whatever billing, like <laughs> sure that needs to be done, but it doesn't have to be done now. <laughs> It's not yes. the most important thing. This is literally my alarm telling me to go to bed. Just so you guys know. <laughs> just so you guys know. Is there like a bat yeah. flying around in your apartment and keep on looking around all crazy? Like no, I thought I had to sneeze. Um, so I was trying to look oh. at the light, but it, but it passed. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, you, you are 100% right. And I, I literally just had that conversation with my coach today. Um, and just kind of reprioritizing because we got a crap ton of moving pieces right now. And it doesn't help that we're out for expo for a couple of days and just kind of reprioritizing. One of my favorite exercises to do personally, Mike, I don't know if you do anything like this or if you have your, your students or clients or whatever you call them, pink paintees, mentees, uh, do this. but I will often, when I have that to do list, I brain dump it all out. And then I categorize into what I call like a, B and C level tasks. A levels are like, this has to get done like today, like today or wh whatever that urgent time frame period is. Maybe that's today and tomorrow before the weekend, whatever it has to get done. B level is like, if this got done, like it would be a win, like not an absolute requirement, but if we get to this, that would be a win. I'd like to C is like, I'm not even expecting to, and really does not need to happen Those at things all. Collect dust on your list. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. C level is like, for some reason, you end up with that day where you're like bored and you're like, what should I work on today? Go to the C-level task. Like there's something. And gradually, sometimes something will be a C-level and three months later, it'll be a high B-level. I actually cranked uh, out a C-level task today and felt really good. <laughs> it's been like sitting there forever and I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So do you do something similar like that? So um, when people join Painter Girl, they're like, I'm going to join to le learn how to get leads and learn how to book sales and learn how to grow my company. And I'm like, yeah, you are going to learn that. But rug pull, there's actually some fundamentals you got to learn first. <laughs> yep. So we give all of our clients one of these. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but this is our, oh, wow. uh, our workbook. And uh, it's constantly making it bigger and better. But pretty much the first thing, we'll have some notes pages. The first thing we do is we have a three-stage um, priority management uh, template. And if anyone wants this template, I can give you a link for it for this podcast. But 
First sure. thing we do, we have everyone do is a time audit. So we say minimum three days, but ideally five days where we cater, we, we help you, we, you track your yeah. time on 15 minute increments to see what you're doing. And um, it's really dejecting to write down that you did 45 minutes of Reddit at 10 a.m. <laughs> yeah. so you're not going to do that you're going to be more productive and you're going to see where you're wasting time but so ideally you do five minutes of this and you're you'll just are blown away everyone is just blown away by how much time they're wasting and how much more time they have in their day the next thing that we have is we once you do that you have we have what we call a d sheet yeah and, i've seen and, you talk about this before and basically this one you take every task that's important that you need to do from your daily time audit and you put it in the d sheet and you basically say, what is the hourly rate? How much does it cost to, to delegate this mm -hmm. task? Does it have to be done by me? And then should I do it, delegate or to dump it? So basically like prioritizing what you're currently doing. And then the final thing is just like you said, a to-do list. So this is so that you can brain dump all of your tasks on a to-do list and then take these things and put them into your schedule, right? What is a priority from one to five? So instead of categorizing, we just have a one to five categorization. How much time is it going to take? What is a task? What are some notes or resources that I need? If anyone wants to copy these three templates, I'll, I'll give, them, give them to you for the, your listeners yeah. to I'll just give you some, a download link. Um, but go through that. You will save 10 hours per week of time and be a lot more organized with your tasks of what you need to do. So that's what we take people through before we go into lead generation and stuff. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So that like time study, time audit is something we did as a team with one of the coaches I work with. Um Super, super eye opening. It's a tough thing sometimes to get people to do. Mm -hmm. It's tough stopping what you're doing every 15 minutes, especially if you're. I say just catch up every couple of hours. Catch up every couple of hours. You can do that for right. sure. Yeah, it, it it can be tough. I know sometimes people will struggle with it, but it can. It's mm -hmm. so valuable. It's That's why so I give it to them printed out because then you don't have an excuse. Keep it's it like you. you don't have to go on your phone. You don't have to do an Excel document. You just yeah. pull up your notebook in your truck or whatever, and like every time you get in your truck, just fill it out. <laughs> Yeah. What did you do the last couple hours? Yeah. I love that. Um, like you said at the beginning of this, we got this, we got this thing expo coming up uh, mm -hmm. a week from today. We'll be there. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Week yeah. from today. I'm stoked, man. Are you excited? Um, I am. I had Maggie on podcast last week. She was oh, dropping Maggie's some bombs awesome. about it. Yeah. It was so fun. Um, but yeah, I'm bringing some team. We got a big double booth right across from Sherwin. We're giving away two, uh paint sprayers dang we're giving away two uh quick shots quick shot ultras hmm. or whatever dude i can act, i should actually like enter these raffles and stuff this year this you is can weird. yeah i see not, not even just i can like i actually should i would have benefit yeah, <laughs> so we're gonna be giving those away we got a qr code at our booth um and uh and just like a short form to fill it to enter and we're gonna be giving away two of them on like probably at like one o'clock on the so next Thursday. So that'd be really exciting. We're giving away 150 t shirts. We got actually a really sick uh design that we're releasing uh for the expo is really cool. Um one of my um my CS manager Anna she uh went out of her way without even asking me. It was like it was amazing. I loved it and design got a mascot design for our company and it is badass. So I'm stoked to That's sick release that at the expo um with 150 shirts and hopefully they're shirts that people want to wear they're pretty cool i think that's sick this is your first expo right yep yep we'll do yeah, well maggie wouldn't let me but... maggie wouldn't give me a stage to myself so she said next year um but i get it i get it maggie that's funny that's funny yeah you gotta, <laughs> gotta, gotta earn your stripes a little bit yep that's absolutely good. no I'll, I'll i'll pay my dues then just a little quick plug if anyone likes in-person events i'm actually doing a mastermind um much smaller in cleveland uh, one day. <laughs> um in just as an exciting of a city uh in minneapolis <laughs> oh, that's cool. um, it's cool and it's in april and it's because um actually uh, largely not entirely but largely because uh jason paris and nick slavic are going to be uh making appearances and speaking and, and doing some presentations so it'll be small probably like 20 30 contractors and and, and team and stuff and um we're gonna do stuff like top golf and have some great food and great times and maybe a couple great cocktails and just like much smaller like kind of work on your business for two full days instead of like just taking information i really yeah. like the collaborative type like walk away with a plan type event i find them really impactful yeah, especially if you can get the right mix of both, which can mm -hmm. be tough. But yeah, 
you can get the right mix of both. Yeah, we did like last one oh, we yeah. did, we did in Phoenix in November. And I think we probably, Jesse and I, I think we facilitated like four sessions, maybe three and a half sessions. And then the rest was like implementation, like working on right. your goals, problem solving, hot seats, um, specific strategic plan, things like that. It was awesome. Got great feedback from it and looking to do something like that again, just like slightly bigger. Yeah, I love that. Well, if you ever did want to host an event in Cleveland, I'm just saying. Uh, you get Heidi I'm there. I'm, you get Heidi there. I'm in. Oh, Heidi's the CEO of Sherwin. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we'll see what we can pull together. So I actually didn't know. Did you guys? I just found this out a couple months ago. You guys know Wooster Brush Company, right? Mm-hmm. Mike definitely knows. Corinne, you're like, I, I think I, I think I, I do. Know the yep. Brand. Uh, do you, okay, good. Cool. Okay, I'll take that. I wouldn't have expected you to, Corinne. Um, so Wooster Brush Company is actually based out of Wooster, Ohio. Duh. Who would have thought? No way. So there's a Wooster, which I knew Wooster, Ohio existed. It's about an hour south of here. Dude, guess I, what they make in Hershey, uh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Um, but uh, I went to school in Ashland, Ohio for a year. That's where I actually got started in the whole remodeling company um, that I always talk about. And that's Wooster's like, I think about 30 minutes or so from Ashland. So when I put two and two together and like their factories there, I'm like, dang, dude, you got Sherwin and Wooster. It's like you, people say Minneapolis is paint Mecca. Cause they got like Greco and they got Jason Phillips and Nick Slavic, but like or Jason Paris, sorry. And Nick Slavic come on. Ohio's got Greco. They're not Greco. I keep messing my words. It's too late for this. Wooster and Sherwin. Yeah. It's a lot. Ohio might paint. be paint Mecca, man. Ohio might be it. But uh, you might need more than that to get me to do a <laughs> mastermind in Cleveland. Yeah, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Yeah, well, Phoenix is good. Phoenix is a good spot in November. Everyone's like ready to go to Phoenix in November. So we might go back again this November. That was pretty fun. Yeah. Well, maybe in due time. We'll see. Yep. Um, but dude, that's really all I got. It's it's 10 o'clock here now. We'll we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Hopefully people enjoyed this. Mike, um, we'll, we'll have that resource pinned in the description um for people to check out give me a link I'll, I'll make sure it's there so people can check it out i think you shared a lot of really good stuff um anything else where can people find you uh yeah man paintergrowth.com that's uh check it out We've got lots of stories free resources we got our podcast the painter growth podcast um which is a lot of fun got like 60 episodes already um growing pretty quickly and just give it a ton of ton of really good value honestly if you like dig around on my site and YouTube page and podcast like for long enough, you can find like a good chunk of like our paid, like behind the scenes resources. Yeah. And like in the words of Alex Hormozzi, um, if you don't give away your best stuff for free, they're going to think all your stuff sucks. So um, we give away our best stuff and uh, we give away the information, sell the implementation. So if you want help, you want the accountability, you want the support, that's what we do. But uh, that's for another day. Too late to pitch that. tonight. I, I love that. Well, let, let me also say this before we wrap up, actually, because um, it'd be very easy to not give credit where credit's due. I want to give you a shout out, Mike. Um, as I've been building my painting company, I've pulled like little bits from everything. And it's been the coolest part because like I, I know all these people from the marketing company. I get to Jason Phillips did this really well. And ooh, I like how Slavic did this and Tanner does this. And it's been really, really fun. A couple things I've taken from you, which I don't even know if you you know. Um, I'm sure you do because you help you. When I did your podcast, I think afterwards you were like, yo, check this out, whatever. Um, but I love calling my crew leads job site managers instead of crew leads. I know it's such a small thing, but it was like when we switch uh, in our marketing company, like instead of account managers to marketing coaches, it's like that's more of what they're actually doing. And it changed a lot of morale and everything. Similar. I love that. You were the one that told me on our bonus structure as we were still kind of in the revision structure. And now we've got the most kick-ass bonus structure. You were the one that was like, don't give them 75% of the overage hours, give them 100% of it. So I just played with it a little bit. And I was like, oh, no. And I just kind of like messed. I was like, I'll just leave it like that for a week. Way better that way. Um, and I want to say it was your expectation, Doc. I think that was you, not Slavic, as well. That I'm, We have some you, of those, yeah. Like the painter expectation, Doc, that you have them sign it? Mm-hmm. I think so yep. I'm sure I've changed it. I know I've changed parts of it and stuff, but like that original like structure and formatting and what I've actually started doing is I go over that in their interview process. 
So we've kind of switched our second interview process where like if they are a good candidate, we're pretty sure we're going to make an offer to them, basically extend the interview by 20, 30 minutes and go through like all almost like the first step of onboarding and like experienced painters are like drooling. They're like, this is amazing. But part of that is that expectation doc, which definitely came from you as well. So, so that's, that's great. And actually um, that's what most people do with our, with our stuff. Like we have, we have the resources and templates for like everything and people take it and like almost no one uses it exactly hard, right it. like you take it you make it your own it's like oh, i don't like this oh we don't really do this type of thing but like we want to do more of this you edit it you make it your own but it's like having that template to get you like 90 percent of the way there is just like so nice like okay i'm doing the right thing i'm on the right path oh i didn't even know i needed something like this it's like i didn't even know i needed a way to track my painter's hours on a daily basis or i didn't even know i needed a, a job site checklist on wrap up like i didn't know i needed that but okay well here's one here's how to use it and then because you use it you're not going to have these challenges anymore so it's like it's like you don't know what you don't know until you've seen it done until you see it done right yeah no 100 100 and sometimes it's just a way to get your ideas going too right like i think of slavic's jump sheet that i took and the current jump sheet we use like it's not even recognizable of his like nobody would look at these two and think these are in any way alike Ours has code embedded into it to automate some part of the job costing based on the hours with it. Like it's totally, but it's like his gave me like a idea to be like, all right, let me take this and change this. And now that's all it takes. Six months that's later, it's it evolved, You're way better because you had the template, even if the template doesn't look like what you're using now. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. So I just want to give you a shout out because those things, those things are things that have stuck from, from little tips and stuff you gave me at some point. Appreciate and, it, man. Uh, I'm glad that you found that value in it. Time. Yeah. Yeah, so I want to give credit where credit's due. Well, but thanks cool. for having me on, brother. Absolutely, brother. We'll post all the stuff in the description, and I will catch y'all on the next episode. Peace out. Yeah.